Hey there, I'm Ken. This is Canadian Retro Things. Welcome. I hope everybody out there watching this video is having a great day. Today, I'm going to jump back into trying to get this slightly frustrating Commodore 64 working. Previously on Canadian Retro Things. I actually just felt that with having my hand over top of it, I could feel the heat coming off those ROM chips already. Nope, we're getting a black screen now. So U25 looks normal. Ta-da! It's working. It's weird that it actually brings up the image and then just doesn't execute anything. That's not supposed to happen. Will Ken get this board working? Is it something completely obvious that he's just overlooking? Find out on today's episode of Canadian Retro Things. Fixing my other, other Commodore 64, part two. But first, a word from our sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay, where you can have PCBs printed starting as low as $5 for 10 PCBs. It's time for the 6th Project Design Contest. Submit a project before January 15th, 2024 to participate. Are there prizes? Why yes, there is. Not only is there 1st, 2nd, and 3rd place prizes, but there's a Popular Design Prize and a Participation Prize. So visit PCBWay today at www.pcbway.com for contest rules, prizes, and information on how to enter. I managed to get this Commodore 64 board working to the point where when you turn it on, it's bringing up the proper screen. But it is still having two issues. Issue number one is the cartridge port is not reading cartridges. Now, the most common thing that I've read that causes that is a bad PLA, but this is a modern PLA that should work in this board. It works in my other Commodore 64, so I'm going to assume that that's working. The other problem is on the keyboard, when you hit the N key a couple of times, it acts like you're hitting the clear key. Now the clear key is when you hit shift and home. So I don't know if that is a problem with a trace, maybe uh, bridging or something like that. That's another thing we'll look into. Now are those two separate problems or are they a single problem? Well, we're going to start by assuming they're two separate problems because they're quite different. The first thing we're going to be doing is we're going to look at the cartridge port. We'll start toning out all the lines to see if they're going where they should go on the board. So let's uh, just turn around and do that. I have a schematic here of the Commodore 64 board that I am currently working on and the first thing I'm going to do is, as I said, tone out all of the cartridge port connections. So looking at the schematic here, we can see that on the cartridge port, pins 1, 22, A, and Z are all ground. So looking at the cartridge port, the top row here are all the numbers. So this would be pin 1 to pin 22. And the bottom are letters, so that's A through Z. It's missing a few uh, letters in there, obviously, because it's only 22 pins and there should be 26 letters, but... we'll do is we'll test pin one ground and 
and this is it. This is what I'm going to be doing for the next little while. Looking at the schematic and going through. So I'm just going to start at the one side here with pin 6, which is a clock signal. Which goes to pin 22 on the VIC chip. So that's 20, 21, and 22. That one's connected. So yeah, I'm not gonna make you sit through me going through every single one of these, but let's jump forward and see how it goes after I've finished checking all of these. All right, and we are on the other side of the board, which is pin five, which is the read write pin. We follow that on the schematic, it looks like it's going to pin 24 on the big chip. Oh no, on U17. 24 on U17. So that's uh Okay, well it is not any of the lines coming out of the part the the cartridge port. They all are connected to where they should be going on the uh, board. So I'll be right back after I look at the schematic a little more and try and uh, figure out if there's something else I should be checking here. Hey there, it's Ken back again. Now something that I forgot that I should have done actually first before testing all of the lines on here is actually look inside the cartridge port to make sure that there's no bent pins, missing pins, or debris in there that might be stopping the cartridge from making a connection. And everything looks good on the inside of the cartridge port. My face would have been awfully red if it had been a piece of paper or something just stuck in there. A little piece that was stopping the cartridge from making contact. And I didn't do that before testing all the lines, but that's not the problem either. So we are eliminating stuff. Let's continue looking at the schematic and see what we can eliminate next. So chip U15 here has uh, address lines 8, 9, 10, and 11 coming to it. So it's a 74 LS139, so a logic chip. So we'll test to see how everything looks there. So address lines 8 and 9 are going into 13 and 14. And 10 and 11 go into 2 and 3. So this is all looking very similar to what it was looking like when I tested it on my working board. However, whether those actual output lines are correct or not, I don't 100% know. So before I get into just willy-nilly taking chips off and replacing them and testing them, I want to uh, follow a few more things. So one of the interesting things on here is that uh, A9 and A8, one of their outputs is to the... Um, U1 here. Now, if this is bad, that could possibly also be the reason that I'm getting that one funky key on the keyboard. So maybe those uh, two problems that I'm having are tied together. But I'm going to look for some more stuff on the board and get back to you. 
due to a small technical glitch, which was me not pressing record on my camera, I failed to record any footage of the thing that I found that led me down the next few things that I did. Now, what I was doing was I was just basically testing everything with my oscilloscope. And then I tested the read write lines. Well, here's a few photos from my oscilloscope to recreate what I saw. The first photo here is a game cartridge on a working board. As you can see, a couple of nice little dips. It's very consistent. And then when I stick it into the non-working board, well, it's completely flatlined. There's no nothing going on on the read write line. But that's not where it gets really weird. Where it gets really weird is if I put the diagnostic cartridge in, then you can see it's got a couple of little dips on the working board. Also very consistent. But when I put it into the non-working board, that read write line goes nuts. It's just lots and lots of dips, singles, doubles, triples, quadruples. It's all over the place. Here is the order that I'm going to do stuff in. Because this chip and this chip are both attached to the read write line. I'm first going to try uh, switching them over to different chips and see if that works. As you can see, I've actually already replaced this chip just to uh, see what would happen. I wanted to test out the line, so I can, uh, I'm can. i going to hook this one up and see if anything has changed. Then I will test out changing this chip. If neither of those do anything, I'm going to desolder the LS chip here and test it. If that's not the problem, I'll go to this one, which could be the problem for both the keyboard and the problem I'm having with this. And if that's not the problem, I guess the uh, 6510 will have to be desoldered and tested. Okay, so here we go with the known working VIC chip in there. We're still getting that screen. Now the kids game. Yeah, that's not the right diagnostic cartridge. And there we go, nothing. Frozen up just like before. For the bonus footage, how about the dead test cartridge? Yep, same thing. We now have a known 6526 in slot U2. Coming up the same. Kids cartridge. Oh, that almost looked like it just about started. Some words flashed on the screen there for a second. How about the diagnostic cartridge? Nothing. Dead test cartridge. Uh. Same thing. I think I'm actually going to start with U1. That's going to be the first one I am going to desolder. And I can put a known working chip in there. Now comes the really fun part of desoldering U1. Now U1 will be all of these 
and all of these. Apply a liberal amount of flux. And start getting rid of some sada. Chip U1 is out. Now, I will put it into a socket. Not completely in, but enough to hold the socket in place while I Stick it into the board. This way it just prevents any of the socket pins from pushing them, making themselves, working themselves out. As can sometimes happen with these. seems to have worked and actually I'm just gonna leave that in there while I start soldering that in place Oops. and you one is now soldered back into place And it's ready to put a chip that is known to be working into there and testing it out. And here we are back at the computer, ready to test this out. U1 and U2 are both known working 6526s. Let's see. That still boots up. The diagnostic cart first. See if that has done anything. Interesting. Now I'm getting absolutely nothing on the diagnostic cart. What about the dead test cartridge? Still the same thing. Ugh. All right, and we'll try the kids' cartridge, kids' game. Okay, we're getting the white screen. Just about started again and then died. All right, well, next thing to try is that logic chip. I have my 74LS139 out of the board, and of course I just noticed that I forgot to hit record on the camera. But let's test this out to see if it is working or not. Logic chip. It's a 74139. Put it in the tester, preferably the right way around, and test. Everything looks normal. Test again, everything's normal. Okay, well, I guess that means that this chip works so. No need to uh, plug any cartridges or anything in to it. Time to move on to the next bit. Okay, so I guess the last chip I can think of changing for right now 
is the 6510. So let's get it out of there and put it in a socket and see what we can do. All right, I have my 6510 out of the board. Got a socket here, so let's put this into place and get soldering that in, and then we can put a different 6510 in to try it out. After a little bit of uh, finagling and cleaning out a couple of the holes, finally got this into place. So let's now solder it. And hope that this is going to solve at least one of my problems. And that is now soldered in place. That's good. Now I can pull it out and go grab a 6510 from one of my other boards. Now, this is actually a chip that I do have a replacement for, but I've never tested this replacement, so I have no idea whether it works or not. So I'm going to use one that I know works. And I can actually test that one out later. All right, let's uh, get this plugged in, a new one plugged into this board and test it out. All right, I got the no one working 6510 in there. That still works. Bonus. So, so far, I haven't broken this machine any worse than it was. Test the cartridge. Same thing. All right, well, let's try the diagnostic cartridge. Same thing. Dead test cartridge. Same thing. Well, I guess the next chips that I'm going to look at are two more chips that are connected to the cartridge port. And those are U26 and U16. So U26 here is a 74LS373. And U16 is a 4066. So both of those I can test with my chip tester. If neither of those are the problem, then possibly U14, I guess, which is right here, which is a 74LS258, or the color RAM. Now, the color RAM I want to do is my last resort because I don't have a spare one of those. I don't think I can test that in my chip tester, which means I have to pull one out of one of my working boards and neither of those boards have them socketed. So let's get started with U16 and U26 first. So we'll pull both of these out right now. Interesting enough, there's a little bit of corrosion around the one pin on this one. I have removed U26 from the board. 
oddly enough, I didn't have any uh, sockets that would fit this, so I've actually got two sockets in here. A six socket and a whatever, I guess that would be a 12 pin socket. Anyway, so it's out. I did, however, run into one little problem. I haven't looked back in the footage yet, but I believe I made a little reference to the fact that I saw some oxidization on the board around a couple of the pins. Well, when I desoldered it, this happened. Unfortunately, one of the pins broke off right at the chip, so I could not repair that. I tried. Um, fortunately, it's a fairly common chip. It's a, uh, what is this? It's a 74LS373, so I can order one of those quite simply. Unfortunately, it also means that if I want to test this board any further, I have to take one out of one of my other boards. So what happened is normally when I desolder the chip completely, I'll hook onto it and then I'll kind of give it a little wiggle back and forth and then it pops right out. Well, I did like I normally do, pulled it up and the one pin stayed behind. I didn't even use that much force. So maybe that was the problem with this computer all along. We'll find out. Fortunately, that one came out without a problem, so I will put a socket into this board, then I'll put this chip in the other board, and God only hopes that was what the problem is. As my luck is going, though, probably won't be. And here we go with testing out the LS373 Ah, oh, crap. Well, this was one of the problems I was worried about with uh, doing all this that you might make a problem worse by just desoldering chips and whatnot. And I appear to have done just that. Well, let's try cartridge just to see if uh, that problem's fixed or did I just make things worse? Yep, uh, I've officially made things worse. Well, so I've been checking all the connections on U26, and I think I discovered the problem for what is currently happening here. Pin 12 on U26 is supposed to be connected to pin 6 on the color RAM. That's three, four, five, six. As you can see, it is not. Which means I've somehow broken the trace between that and that. Uh, probably lifted a solder pad or something like that. Anyways, that means I'm gonna have to put a bodge wire in. However, the color RAM was one of the things I was going to be taking out in a couple of chips. So I guess I'm going to jump that forward to the next chip that I take out and then I will bodge wire the two uh, the lines there and yeah, go from there. Uh, I'm not defeated yet. I am not defeated yet. I have a plan of action. I know what I'm going to do next on this board. Unfortunately, it is fixing something that I broke, but hey, at least it will be 
hopefully a little bit of a step back to where I started this video from. Yeah, I really haven't accomplished anything in this video. I put a lot, bunch of sockets on the board. That's about it. So I think this video has to be stamped with a big old F for failure. But yeah, I got a lot of soldering practice. So there's the positive. I know what I'm doing next time, which is fixing a problem I created. Um, I'm going to stop the video here today because my head's about to explode from thinking about this board. So I'm going to take a little bit of a break. So I hope you enjoyed watching this slow descent into madness of trying to get this board fixed that I have been having. If you did, don't forget that a like, a subscribe, and a comment below are all things that help the channel out a lot and are greatly appreciated. But until the next video, I will see you next time.